Well, welcome again to another podcast, Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. I'm your host, Irv Risch. And as we move forward, we're going to be going through the entire New Testament. Uh, and with that, we're going to do a commentary afterwards. And uh, with that said, let us just move on to our next section. And thank you for joining me. Chapter 20 After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos, and the day after that we went to Miletus for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. 
In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how He Himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when He had said these things, He knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Acts chapter 20 20 verse 1, from verse 1 it would appear that the apostle traveled directly from Ephesus to Macedonia. However, from 2 Corinthians we learn that he first went to Troas. There he found an open door to preach the gospel but was anxious to see Titus and to learn from him how the Corinthians had received his first epistle. When he did not find Titus in Troas, he crossed over the northeastern corner of the Aegean Sea to Macedonia. Undoubtedly, he landed at Nepolis, then traveled inland to Philippi. While in Macedonia, probably at Philippi, he met Titus and was greatly encouraged by the news from Corinth. It was probably at this time that he wrote 2 Corinthians, A.D. 56. See 2 Corinthians 1 verses 8 and 9, 2 verses 12 to 14, 7 verses 5 to 7. 20 verses 2, 3a, after ministering for some time in Macedonia, he journeyed south to Greece or Achaia. Most of the three months there were undoubtedly spent in Corinth, and it was during this period that he wrote Romans. Some also believe that Galatians was written at this time. 20 verse 3b, originally, Paul had planned to travel straight from Corinth across the Aegean to Syria. However, when he learned that the Jews were plotting to destroy him somewhere along that route, he changed his plans and went northward again through Macedonia. 20 verses 4, at this time we are introduced to some of Paul's traveling companions. It is stated that they accompanied him as far as Asia, but we know that certain of them even went with him to Rome. So Peter of Berea was possibly the same as Sosipater, a relative of Paul mentioned in Romans 16 verse 21. Aristarchus of Thessalonica nearly lost his life in the riot at Ephesus, Acts 19 verse 29. We later read of him as being a fellow prisoner with Paul in Rome, Philemon. 24, Colossians 4 verse 10. Secundus, also a native of Thessalonica, accompanied Paul as far as Asia, probably Troas or Miletus. Gaius of Derb is not to be confused with the Macedonian who was seized by the mob at Ephesus, Acts 19 verse 29. Another Gaius is mentioned as being an inhabitant of Corinth and Paul's host while there, Romans 16 verse 23. John's third epistle is addressed to a man named Gaius, probably living in some city near Ephesus. Gaius was a very common name. Timothy not only accompanied Paul to Asia but was with him in Rome during his first imprisonment. Subsequently he traveled with Paul through proconsular Asia. In his second letter to Timothy, Paul expressed the desire to see him again, but we do not know whether this wish was ever fulfilled. Tychicus, a native of Asia Minor, probably journeyed as far as Miletus with the Apostle. Later he rejoined Paul in Rome and is mentioned as laboring with him up to and during the time of his second imprisonment. Trophimus was apparently a Gentile whose home was in Ephesus, in Asia Minor. He went with Paul to Jerusalem and unwittingly was the cause of the Apostle's arrest. He is also mentioned in 2 Timothy 4 verse 20. 20 verses 5, 6, it appears that the above seven brethren traveled on ahead to Troas, while Paul and Luke visited Philippi. We believe that Luke was with the apostle because of the use of the first-person pronoun, us in verse 5, we in verse 6, etc. After the days of unleavened bread, or the Passover, Paul and Luke sailed from Macedonia to Troas. The journey would not ordinarily have taken five days. No explanation is given here for the delay. 20 verses 7 to 9, comparing verses 6 and 7, it appears that the apostle purposely waited in Troas for seven days so he could be there for the breaking of bread on the Lord's Day. It is certainly clear from verse 7 that it was the practice of the early Christians to gather together on the first day of the week in order to observe the Lord's Supper. That Paul should have spoken until midnight should cause us no shocked surprise. 
When the spiritual temperature of a church is high, the Spirit of God is free to work without being fettered by the bondage of timepieces. As the night wore on, it became hot and stuffy in the upper room. Perhaps the many lamps contributed to this, as well as the number of people present. A certain young man named Eutychus, sitting in an open window, fell asleep and plummeted to the ground below. It was a fall of three stories, and he was killed by it. 20 verse 10, But Paul went down and stretched himself over the body of the young man, as the prophets did of old. He then announced to the people that they should not make any more fuss about the matter since Eutychus was now alive. It might seem from Paul's words that their concern was unnecessary because the young man had not died, his life was still in him. But it is clear from verse 9 that he was actually dead. Acting with the power of an apostle, Paul had miraculously restored him to life. 20 verses 11, 12, When Paul returned upstairs, they broke bread, verse 11, i.e., they observed the Lord's Supper, for which they had come together, verse 7. Then they ate a common meal, perhaps the agape or love feast. This fellowship meal was held in conjunction with the Lord's Supper in the early days of the church, but abuses crept in, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 20-22, and it was gradually discontinued. After an all-night meeting, never to be forgotten, the apostle bade farewell to the believers in Troas. 20 verses 13-15, Paul left Troas on foot and walked 20 miles across the neck of a promontory of land to Assos. His traveling companions went by ship around the promontory, then picked him up on the southern side. Perhaps he wanted time to be alone and to meditate on the Word of God. Sailing south along the western coast of Asia Minor, they first came to Mytilene, pronounced Mitiluene, the chief city of the island of Lesbos. The following night, they apparently anchored off the island of Chios, pronounced Kios. Another day's journey brought them to the island of Samos, and they stayed at Trogilium. Finally the travelers put in at Miletus, a port on the southwest coast of Asia Minor, 36 miles south of Ephesus. 20 verse 16, Paul intentionally bypassed Ephesus, because he feared that a visit there would occupy too much time, and he was hurrying to get to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. 20 verse 17, upon landing at Miletus, Paul sent word to the elders in Ephesus, asking them to come for a meeting. Undoubtedly it took considerable time for the message to reach them, and for them to make the journey south. However, they were well rewarded by the magnificent message they heard from the lips of the great apostle. In it we have a valuable portrait of an ideal servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see a man who was fanatically devoted to the Savior. He labored in season, out of season. He was tireless, indomitable, indefatigable. He was marked by true humility. No cost was too great for him to pay. His ministry was the result of deep exercise of soul. He had a holy boldness and fearlessness. Whether he lived or died was not important, but it was important that the will of God should be carried out and that men should hear the gospel. He was unselfish in all that he did. He would rather give than receive. He was undaunted by difficulties. He practiced what he preached. 20 verses 18, 19, the apostle reminded the elders of Ephesus of his manner of life when he lived among them. From the first day that he set foot in Asia, and all the time he was there, he served the Lord with true humility and self-denial. In connection with his ministry, there was a constant strain on his emotional system, there were tears of sorrow and trials. Constantly he suffered persecution as a result of the plotting of the Jews. Yet in spite of all the adverse circumstances, his ministry was bold and fearless. 20 verses 20, 21, Paul held back nothing from the Ephesians that would be for their spiritual welfare. He taught them publicly and from house to house, constrained by the love of Christ. To him, it was not a matter of holding meetings at stated intervals, but rather of buying up every opportunity to encourage growth among the believers. Without discrimination as to nationality or religious background, he preached the necessity of repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. These are two fundamental elements of the gospel. In every genuine case of conversion, there are both repentance and faith. They are the two sides of the gospel coin. Unless a person were duly repentant, saving faith would be impossible. On the other hand, repentance would be of no avail unless it was followed by faith in the Son of God. 
Repentance is an about face by which the sinner acknowledges his lost condition and bows to God's judgment as to his guilt. Faith is commitment of oneself to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In many NT passages, faith alone is stated to be the condition of salvation. However, faith presupposes repentance. How could a person truly accept Jesus Christ as Savior unless he realized that he needed a Savior? This realization, brought about by the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, is repentance. 20 verses 22, 23, having reviewed his past conduct among the Ephesians, the apostle now looks ahead to the sufferings that await him. He was constrained in his spirit to go to Jerusalem. It was an inner compulsion which he was apparently unable to throw off. Although he did not know exactly what the turn of events would be in Jerusalem, he did know that chains and tribulations would be a regular part of his life. The Holy Spirit had been making this fact known to him in every city, perhaps through the ministry of prophets, or perhaps by the mysterious, inner communication of divine intelligence. 20 verse 24 As the apostle weighed this outlook in his mind, he did not think that his own life was the great consideration. His ambition was to obey God and to please Him. If in doing this, he would be called upon to offer up his life, he was willing to do so. No sacrifice he could make would be too great for the one who died for him. All that mattered was that he finish his race and complete the ministry which he received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. No title could better express the good news which Paul preached, the gospel of the grace of God. It is the thrilling message of God's undeserved favor to guilty, ungodly sinners who deserve nothing but everlasting hell. It tells how the Son of God's love came from heaven's highest glory to suffer, bleed, and die on Calvary in order that those who believe on Him might receive forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. 20 verses 25 to 27, Paul was sure he would never see his beloved Ephesian brethren again, but his conscience was clear in leaving them, because he knew he had not held back from declaring to them the whole counsel of God. He had instructed them not only in the fundamentals of the gospel, but in all the truths that were vital for godly living. 20 verses 28, Since he would never again meet them on earth, he delivered a solemn charge to the elders that they should first of all take heed to their own spiritual condition. Unless they were living in fellowship with the Lord, they could not expect to be spiritual guides in the church. Their function as elders was to take heed to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit had made them overseers. As mentioned previously, overseers in the NT are also called bishops, elders, and presbyters. This verse emphasizes that elders are not appointed or elected by the local assembly. They are made overseers by the Holy Spirit and should be recognized by the believers among whom they labor. Among other things they were responsible to shepherd the church of God. The importance of such a charge is seen in the words which follow, which he purchased with his own blood. This latter expression has been the cause of considerable discussion and disagreement among Bible scholars. The difficulty is that God is here pictured as shedding his blood, whereas God is spirit. It was the Lord Jesus who shed his blood, and although Jesus is God, yet nowhere else does the Bible speak of God bleeding or dying. The majority of manuscripts read the Church of the Lord and God which he purchased with his own blood, apparently suggesting that person of the Godhead, the Lord, who actually shed his blood. Perhaps J. N. Darby comes closest to the correct sense of the passage in his new translation, the assembly of God, which he has purchased with the blood of his own. Here God is the one who purchased the church, but he did it with the blood of his own Son, the blessed Lord Jesus. 20 verses 29, 30, Paul was well aware that after his departure, the church would be attacked from without and from within. False teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, would prey upon the flock, showing no mercy. From within the fellowship, men would aspire to places of prominence, speaking perversions of the truth, and trying to draw away the disciples after themselves. 20 verse 31, In view of these imminent perils, the elders should be on their guard, and constantly remember how for three years the apostle had warned them night and day with tears. 20 verse 32, Paul's great resource now was to commend them to God and to the word of his grace. Notice that he did not commend them to other human leaders, or to supposed successors of the apostles. Rather he entrusted them to God and the Bible. This is an eloquent testimony to the sufficiency of the inspired scriptures. It is they which are able to build up the believers and to give them an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
20 verses 33 to 35, in closing his message, the Apostle Paul once again set before the elders the example of his own life and ministry. He could say in all honesty that he had coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. It was not the hope of financial gain that motivated him in the work of the Lord. He was essentially a poor man, as far as material things were concerned, but he was rich toward God. Holding out his hands before them, he could remind them that those hands had labored in order to provide for the necessities of life, both for himself and for those who were with him. But he went beyond that also. He labored as a tentmaker in order that he might have means to help the weak, those physically ill, or weak as far as moral scruples are concerned, or weak in spiritual matters. The elders should remember this, and seek in all things the good of others, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Interestingly enough, these words of our Lord are not found in any of the Gospels. They do represent the sum of much of His teaching, but here they are given as an inspired addition to His words in the Gospels. 20 verses 36 to 38, at the conclusion of His message, Paul knelt on the ground and prayed with the elders. For them it was a time of deep sorrow. They showed their affection for the beloved apostle by falling on his neck and kissing him. The thing that particularly grieved them was his statement that they would see his face no more. Heavy-hearted, they accompanied him to the ship for the voyage to Jerusalem. Well, this ends another one of our podcasts. And until uh, next time, just remember, God is out here. And you can find out all about him in your Bibles. All you have to do is pick it up and read it. I have mine right here. And uh, God is in this Bible. So please read it. With that said, bye for now. Till next time.